what about the tumors? What kind of tumors are you going to say? Well, very high histologic, histological spectrum that you're going to see. The way I like to think, again, as Dr. Roden taught us, three things. Think of it in threes. You have the germ cell derivatives, okay, such as germ, germinomas. Then you have the non-germ cell, three baskets, non-germ cells, the malignant transformation of pineal, those pineal sites that turn uh, into malignancy, uh, malignant transformation of pineal parenchymal cells. Now, Everything else, think about where that pineal region is. It's near the tentorium. It's near arteries and veins. It's near the chori plexus. So you can have any other tumor there, okay? So you can have a chori plexus papilloma. You can have an ependymoma, a meningioma, metastases are even known to be there, all right? So here, one of the things that I added in this talk is the dreaded pineal cyst subject. Okay, this is so controversial. I'm not, not here making normative uh, judgments, but this is the way I think about pineal cysts, okay? There was a paper by my friend Charlie Teo from Australia about, you know, pineal cyst or section in the absence of ventricular megaly or paranoid syndrome. Uh, Yashir Kalani was the first author, and that paper is what it is. But the way I look at it is, um, what is the incidence of headaches? So patients are going to come to you with headaches and a pineal cyst. The reality is this is from the Institute of Healthcare Metrics, the same people who are tracking COVID-19 right now. And what they concluded in 2017 is the number one cause of neurologic morbidity in the world, all 200 countries, is headaches. Okay, number two is headaches. Number three is headaches. Number four is Alzheimer's. And of course, the number one killer is stroke, but a quarter of a billion people at any given time in the world have headaches. Number one is tension headache. Number two um, is migraines. And number three is drug withdrawal headaches. So why is that important? Because you're going to see patients all the time with pineal cysts. How do I know? How do I know you're going to see patients with pineal cysts? Because there's paper after paper that show that up to 23%, this is a paper out of MD Anderson, that shows that up to 23% of normal patients, patients that come in for a brain, this was a brain mapping exercise, 23% of them are going to have pineal cysts. So, I would recommend that you not operate on every patient with a pineal cyst and a headache, okay? Because billions of people have headaches and pineal cysts occur naturally in people. And I can tell you I've operated on one pineal cyst in my career and that's because it looked like a tumor. So let me lay that to rest, but you'll have to make your own judgments. So the CSF markers help. Now, when I was a resident, um, uh, let me just uh, hold on a second, get that down. Uh, when I was a resident, uh, we used to get CSF markers and blood markers and wait till they were back until we'd operate on a patient. But this is a wonderful study done by the Canadians. They put all their uh, children with central nervous system germ cell tumors together and they looked at the beta HCG alpha feed of protein. Okay, and guess what? Their conclusion was this. Only 7% of people with germ cell tumors were even positive for beta HCG, and 36% with non germ cell germinomatous tumors. And same with alpha feed of protein, none were positive with beta HCG, but only 34% for non germ cell tumors. So, what's the conclusion? You know what? CSF markers are useful when they're high, and you thought, let's say you have a really malignant pineal region tumor, and you get CSF markers, but they're really just useful in assessing the success of treatment in malignant tumors, okay? I hope that makes sense. Now, here's our experience. I'm, it's a small experience. Anybody who tells you they do a lot of pineal tumors, they're probably not telling you the truth. It, five years, two-year follow-up, um, and uh, Josh did bivariate relationships because when you have a small number of cases, 
okay? It's very hard to exact relationships. So ANOVA testing, Fisher exact test, post-op, and one of the ingenious things Josh did is he looked at the Karnofsky score. No one's ever looked at a Karnofsky score in patients with pineal region tumors. Let me point out to you, so 30, 30 males, 20 females, of course, representing the high number, 20% of these were germ cell tumors, okay? Now, interesting, 52% um, uh, were pediatric patients, the other 48% were adult patients, including people over 40 years of age. You can see the, the uh, Karnofsky scores were all over the place. They're people that came in good, there are people that came in not so good, and the reason why is this, right over here. A third of them were less than a cubic uh, five centimeters cubed. A third of them were five to nine, and then there were some really big tumors. So these tumors, like ventricular tumors, grow really large before they're diagnosed, okay? And um, they come in very large, they come in with obstructive hydrocephalus, and they come in sick and stay in the ICU for a long time. Now, this was fascinating. When Josh looked at all the patients, guess what? Only 75% of them had headaches, okay? I would, thought, I would have thought 100%, but not. 42% nausea and vomiting, and paranoid syndrome, I thought I would think 100%, right? No. Only 25% have paranoids, and this is paranoid syndrome, of course, as we know, upward gaze uh, palsy, accommodation palsy, lid retraction, convergence palsy, lateral nystagmus, upward nystagmus, and light near dissociation. And you can see that was extremely rare in, these ser in this series. Interesting. Um, so, so what, what are the definitive approaches that I'm going to talk about? Well, I'm going to talk about a bunch of them, and, and they're all good, and you use them for different anatomy and geometry of the tumors. So the majority of germ cell tumors, you can do an ETV and biopsy at the same time, a stereotactic biopsy, okay? Um, this was the approach supercerebellar infratentorial described many years before and then repopularized by Bennett Stein from Columbia in the 70s and 80s. Um, I love this approach, first described by Dandy, the posterior interhemispheric transplenial approach. We'll go over that. And then the occipital, the other major approach is the occipital transtentorial approach, okay? So those are the definitive approaches I used. Now let's go over the tumors that we saw. There are two tumors that I, wanna, I want your attention to be attracted to. The papillary tumor of the pineal region and the pineal parenchymal tumor of intermediate differentiation. There were three of that and five of those. You probably, the World Health Organization just classified those tumors in the last 10 years. And their primary pineal, pineal site uh, malignant degeneration tumors. And I will tell you, at first I thought these were very benign tumors, and as I've followed them over the years, they're a little, you, one needs to be a little more cautious about these diagnoses. If you get them, they really need to be followed cautiously because some go on and some stay stable. So you can see in our series we had germ cells, pineal sites, pineal blastomas, astrocytomas, non-germ cell, germ cell tumors, choriplex, it's all over, as I said, a wide spectrum in three categories, germ cell tumors, tumors from the pineal region, and then all those tumors from the material around the pineal region, like choroid plexus and meningiomas and so on and so forth. Now this slide is a busy slide, but what it tells you is young, in my series, the young kids did better than the older people in terms of their Karnofsky on admission. The bigger the tumor, uh, the more chance they would end up in the ICU, and why? Because of the hydrocephalus. The bigger the tumor, more chance you had hydrocephalus, um, and it was a huge predictor by the p-value for the Karnofsky on admission, which makes absolute perfect sense.